I want to welcome everybody on behalf of the Parent Education Committee. I, my name is Lorraine Fairmont, and we have some people, a few people here from other schools. I want to get started. I want to introduce to you Michael Gaeta, who is a parent here at Shining Mountain and published Thomas Cooper's book and is really the, in, the instigator in getting Thomas Cooper to come speak with our school. Um, Dr. Cooper also spoke, spoke to the high schoolers this morning, and I was able to hear part of that. And it was fascinating. If you have high schoolers, you might ask them what they thought of that program. Michael is going to continue to do And uh, it's really been a, a wonderful journey uh, working with Tom. We've known each other about 25 years. And it was some years ago that he sent me a book, a workbook that he had written for his students on how to take a media fast and a media diet. And I began using the material in my practice with patients, particularly during a uh, cleansing or detoxification cycle. And people found it very helpful when they were doing their cleanse. They said, some of them said the media fast was their favorite part. And I got to thinking, Tom and I had a talk one day. I said, Tom, you know, he's published six books before. I said, who's your publisher for this thing? He said, well, nobody. I said, well, why don't we do it? Uh, so we uh, set off on a, a year-long journey of, of, of putting the book into its uh, wonderful finished form. Uh, and so it's been an honor to know Tom and to help bring this work into the world. Uh, Tom is one of the world leaders in the field of media, ethics, and culture. Uh, he's a professor at Emerson College in downtown Boston, where many of our Shining Mountain graduates have gone to uh, over the years. Uh, Tom received his undergraduate degree from Harvard University and his master's and PhD uh, from University of Toronto. Uh, Tom was a speechwriter at the, at the White House uh, back along the way, and, uh, and, he'll, and, and the part of the material for this book are the years he spent, um, and parts of those years spent uh, in, on a media fast himself. And he'll tell you about that story of living with people with little or no media. And that was uh, part of the basis for the material of the book. So I'm just so thankful for you that you're all here to hear Dr. Cooper speak. He's a real gem. And, uh, and what his message is very congruent with us as Waldorf <coughs> parents and families uh, have known to be true. And uh, Tom is going to share, I think, some wonderful uh, new information with us, as well as reinforce the absolute accuracy of what we've been doing in the uh, you know, uh, Waldorf community, though seen as weird by some is really on target, and, uh, and I, I think you'll find by the end of our evening, you'll, you'll know that you made a really good choice, and uh, uh, yet another reason why you made another really good choice to, for us to have our, our children uh, nurtured here in this wonderful environment. So, uh, it's my deep privilege, and, and Tom and I have been working pretty hard the past few days. This is his, the eighth of his eight appearances. Uh, he's spoken at Denver Waldorf School, uh, the uh, Mountain Phoenix uh, Community School, Waldorf Inspired, uh, as well as uh, the uh, Metropolitan State University, Naropa University, Sunrise Ranch in Loveland, and uh, and he's uh, he's I just have to say he's on a roll. Uh, it's really wonderful. I mean, I, you know, I'm a full-time professional speaker, and so when I see somebody on a roll and they're really in their slot. It's a beautiful thing. So you'll see what I'm talking about shortly. So please help me welcome my dear friend, Dr. Many thanks to Lorraine Fairmont and to David Blair and to Chris Sassano, to Dave Brimmer, Alex Beal at the back, and everyone on the Parent Ed Committee, everyone who played a part whether on the program committee or with publicity or logistics. And I want to show my special thanks to Lorraine by giving a signed book to your library here. And she is, of course, representing the Waldorf community. This is from me to you with love. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Tonight wouldn't be possible without many old friends such as that outstanding health practitioner, Michael Gaeta, who you know as a Waldorf parent and in many other ways. He was also our musician last night and he's going to be single-handedly building the next gym for you. Uh, he's, in other words, a jack of all trades and a master of many. And two outstanding legal eagle friends, Deanna Waldrum, his wife, and Charlene Hunter, who's down in Denver, who helped us with that uh, community and, and had a wonderful talk last night. And I want to acknowledge an old friend, Keith Fairmont, who's here tonight. You may recognize the last name. 
um, very good friend from way back. Uh, and our, my daughter and um, his first son are uh, playmates from way back as well. So thank you so much for being here. And uh, new friend Jack is here as well, uh, who I just met over dinner. So now you know whom to finger when they wake you up with loud snoring in 20 minutes. My field is ordinarily called media ethics, and most people immediately say, isn't that an oxymoron? And as you know, many oxymorons are um, quite lovely from literary sources like The Darkness Visible, but many of the ones we hear these days are more like uh, underpaid athlete, and my two most favorite recent ones, Jumbo Shrimp and Boneless Ribs, <laughs> if you think about it. Elevator Music is a longtime uh, competitor in their university food. But media, uh, army intelligence, but media ethics often takes the cake, and I hear about it constantly. Michael and Deanna have been chauffeuring me to eight different locations, and so I really empathize with them and appreciate them and have said perhaps they could tell the lecture now by heart themselves, verbatim. And that reminded me of the great European physicist, Max von Terkel, whose chauffeur did, in fact, having heard his lecture a hundred times, offer to give his lecture for him verbatim. <laughs> and much to his surprise, Van Terkel said, all right, then I get to sleep in the back row the way that you've done every time. <laughs> Let's swap roles after all. So they had a friendly bet about whether he could pull this off, and indeed the chauffeur waxed eloquently for a full 45 minutes until he realized there'd be questions at the end. And of course, he had only memorized the speech, not understanding all of the formulas. And one of the great rivals of Von Terkel was in the back of the room who stood up and said, how could a man of your obvious intelligence confuse the great formula e to the ypypi minus x with plus x? How can you explain this? And the poor chauffeur was up there dumbfounded and finally said, well, my dear sir, I'm surprised that a man of your obvious intelligence would ask such a piddling question. And to show you just how lackluster and commonplace it is, I'm going to ask my chauffeur to answer it for me. <laughs> so later on tonight, if you try to stump me, I must warn you, I have two chauffeurs <laughs> present. And I apologize to them for the predictability of what I have to say. But that said, I do need to let you know that if you're a rival or a heckler, my chauffeurs are prepared. Earlier today, I had flashback memories also of my undergraduate life at Harvard because I met a Radcliffe woman, which in those days we looked way up to coming into as freshmen, uh, who was my first date. And I had no idea that I'd be bumping into her. We called them cliffies in those days. They were a special species to us freshmen. <laughs> They spoke 18 languages, invented computers in their you know, third grade, and um, you just knew you couldn't ask them even how's the weather, or you'd get a barometric reading. So um, I was just a freshman, and it didn't occur to me, with apologies to any Radcliffe women who are in the room, they're not all this way, but I, I wasn't sure that even if I invited them to a football game, they would look at the sport with great intellectual and moral disdain, compare it to tribal warfare, and admit they'd never attended a game in their lives. Now. These were Ivy League colleagues, and yet they seemed not to have affection for any signs of cultural brutality, which football symbolized. So when I finally worked up my freshman's courage to talk to someone who was cute, I was concerned about what the response would be, and I only talked her into going to a football game if she could see it as an anthropology project. So anthropology, of course, is a study of humanity and its various cultures, and my date said she'd be analyzing this quasi primate behavior and let me know her findings after the game. So we watched the Harvard Dartmouth game and when it was over I thought I'd be, you know, treated to a, a tabula rosa analysis of something virginal intellectually uh, and would finally find out what it's all about. And she said, it's not the anthropology of the sport, which is a key point of analysis, but the economics. And I thought to myself, what in the world is she talking about? And what am I getting into here? So I pressed her for an explanation and she said, well, I just couldn't understand why grown men would fight for two hours over just 25 cents. And now she really had me and I said, what in the world do you mean? And she replied, well, at the beginning of the game, one man flipped a coin which looked like a quarter. And then for the rest of the game, everyone kept shouting, get the quarter back, get the quarter back. Tonight, 
Tonight I want to talk about a world which gives us as unique and bizarre misinterpretation of the game of life as my date gave me about football. In the electronically mediated world, I want to give you an example about how this myth interpretation, no, that's not a lisp, myth interpretation of life works via the media. Every year I query my students about how they obtain their, quote, knowledge. I'll ask how many of them, as I asked some of your children today, how many of you have opinions about Obama? It's, by the way, okay to raise your hands if you want to. How many of you have opinions about Romney? How many of you have had opinions about Osama bin Laden? How many have opinions about Lady Gaga? And on every single name, they all raise their hands. And then I ask, so how many of you have actually spent at least eight hours with any of these people off camera to see what they're really like unedited and none raise their hands? Now do we get the joke about the quarterback? And I'll ask them, how many of you have read at least three serious works of well-researched, substantiated scholarship about any of these individuals from at least three completely different perspectives by veteran credentialed experts and none raise their hands? I do love my students. They're university students. They're bright. They're brimming with energy and vigor and ideas. And so I'm not suggesting something's true about them, which is not also true whenever I give lectures at universities or organizations or clubs. And please know I greatly cherish all my friends who go to or once attended or teach at Waldorf schools. I've just been to two others and was at a third out east. And I have a strong alliance with many Waldorf friends who share a common longing for a low screen, if not a no screen culture. But let me tell you what we know about the hazards of secondhand, secondhand media. Secondhand smoke is the same idea. And those of us who do not consume much media still suffer from secondhand media or else all the hands wouldn't go up about Obama and Lady Gaga. And so that secondhand media illusion we have is that we actually are free of media influence and yet when we hear the name Sarah Palin or Katy Perry or the war in Iraq or Afghanistan, we talk as if we know something. So we say we know about but what is the current character of our knowing via Wikipedia, or Fox, or tweets, or iPads, or jingles, or sound bites, or tabloids, or infotainment, and recycle serialized sensationalism in this decade? I call that the new epistemology. Epistemology being, of course, the study of the nature of the character limits, origins, and ways of knowing and knowledge. We think we know, but how do we know if we know and what we know? And if what we think we know is knowing and involves thinking. I don't know about you, I don't know about you, but often after I've been talking to someone for say 10 minutes, whether we're talking about Afghanistan or the reputed lost continent of Atlantis, I can often tell whether I'm hearing ABC or NBC or Fox or BBC or Boston Online or PerezHilton.com because what we hear increasingly I'm going to suggest is not original thinking, and I'm not doing this condescendingly, it applies to myself, is not original thinking, but rather recycled media dialects from the five primary political parties of our day, CNN, CBS, NBC, ABC, and Fox, with PBS, NPR, <coughs> Stephen Colbert, John Stewart, and a lot of dot-coms on the margins. So increasingly what we hear, I'm going to argue, is not thinking, but rather audience programming. Now, usually when I say this, I hear the bright objection, okay, that's them, but I personally am not programmed. And then my question becomes, when we say this, are we emulating the disciples who every time the guru at the front of the room says, we are all free thinkers, nod their heads and say, we are all free thinkers. <laughs> now, again, I don't mean this in a condescending way because I'm not saying you personally, I'm saying we culturally and we globally and we.com. During our education, most if not all of us were encouraged to be independent, individual, critical thinkers. And yet increasingly and currently when I ask my students and even my colleagues, many of whom are from the Ivy League or Oxbridge or the left coast Stanford Berkeley Mafia, have you ever, have you ever had an original thought? And then I ask them to tell me what it was most are hard-pressed to prove to me that the thought is genuinely original. 
How would you know total originality and how could you prove it? How could we be sure in a mediated world it wasn't intravenously inserted by a teacher, a textbook, or a radio commercial in the background when we were in third grade? Dr. Marie Prasinski, a leading researcher about the human brain at Harvard Medical School, a good friend, was kind enough to share with me some of the expertise about how the brain works from an anatomical, neurological, and psychological standpoint. And I was very grateful to learn from her astute intelligence. But I want to add another level to what specialists say is inside the brain that they don't usually talk about. In our brains, there is also content, including recycled e-info of all kinds. So if you created a pie chart of the collective American brain, not any individual, but the collective American brain at this stage, you might see something very different from the collective medieval brain, from the medieval to the evil media we're going to go. The medieval brain was very differently constructed. In the 21st century, the US mega brain, that's all Americans put together, might look something like this on a pie chart. 10% pornography, 15% advertising, 15% sound bites and talking heads, 15% entertainment clips such as rock videos, car chases, and violence, which I call, by the way, clash, crash, slash, for cash. <laughs> 10% Facebook and other social media fragments, and perhaps only 5% analytic thinking, perhaps 10% memories of firsthand experiences, and 10% conversational remnants, and similar. Whether or not these figures are accurate, I'm just basing them on various studies, they may not be. I think you can still see the primary sources and ratios of experience, memory, and subconscious storage are extremely different than, say, in the so-called Dark Ages or the Renaissance, or during the Ming Dynasty. Just to give you a personal example, sometimes I wake up singing, I'm a material girl. <laughs> but clearly I'm neither. Or I might wake up, wake up singing a more recent lyric, I'm Katy Perry's teenage dream, but I'm also neither of those. So when I do that, I often ask my colleagues, students, and anyone who enjoys thinking, which might well be us tonight, I trust. So just who am I, or who are we, beneath our programming? Now, perhaps some of you are already engaged by this line of thinking, but I think I know my academic friends and parental friends in an educational setting well enough to know that others of you need proof, evidence, statistics, lab results, and the numbers, not just my personal view of it. So here is some research which is based over on over 173 studies over 28 years, which includes those from Yale University School of Medicine, the National Institute of Health, California Pacific Medical Center, and many more. And when I wrote the book, this was the data. At that time, children ages 6 to 12 were spending 45 hours per week with media, 30 hours per week in school, and 17 hours a week with parents. So who are the real teachers in this generation? MTV and VH1, Facebook, Gossip Girl, <coughs> Wikipedia, the iPad, Beyonce, Jenna Jameson, Howard Stern, Michael Moore, Twitter. Ask 107-year-olds what they know about Pocahontas or Aladdin and listen to their facts and odds are, especially if they don't go to a Waldorf school, what they know is Disney, not Pocahontas, not Aladdin, not literature and textbooks, not that I'm claiming textbooks are necessarily reliable knowledge either. So let me save a lot of time by not giving you all the numbers because I've just spent a lot of time myself synthesizing quite a number of summaries of what key studies of young people exposed to media would find. So if I were to predict what I might be saying to you five years from now based on trends, despite various exceptions and qualifications, I'd say in broad brushstrokes the following, summarizing all the key studies on the impact of media on children. The greater the excessive consumption of mainstream entertainment media, the higher the odds a child will become, one, obese, two, ADD, three, alcohol or tobacco dependent, Four, academically mediocre or poor. Five, housebound. Six, prematurely sexually active or pregnant. Seven, violent. 
eight, or and distant if not alienated from parents and peers. What a strong statement when you put all the studies together. Many of them are independent about just one part of this. It does not mean if a child consumes media, they will become all of these. I want to be very careful. It says the greater the excessive consumption of mainstream entertainment media, the higher the odds a child will become, some if not all of these. Now naturally there are exceptions to all of this. And for those of you who are methodologists or scientists, we could spend two to three hours citing all the qualifications and defining terms and discussing methods and going into all the differing studies and their interpretations. But I thought you'd want to know the bottom line to save all of that time. Round it off to the nearest dollar rather than pursuing pennies and dimes for the rest of the evening. Now that's children. What about those of us who are presumably teaching them? American adults. According to Nielsen's 2010 three screen report, adults continue to increase video and TV consumption more than five hours per person per day, four hours of internet per day, and 60% of us do that concurrently. So the handheld and the screen are playing at the same time, whichever one we're giving focus to, or double screens. What about youth, the age group we're supposed to be preparing for leadership, our teens and our preteens? For entertainment media, the consumption is seven and a half hours used per day by eight to 18 year olds, more than 53 hours per week. But I wanna remove the demographic for a minute and talk about everyone. Everyone, the average American currently will spend three years of his or her life watching television commercials alone. Three years of one's life watching just television commercials. I haven't gone into all the other media or all the other parts of television. You're going to hear a DVD clip later that says two years. That's because it was two years ago that that was scripted. And so that means it's gone from two years to three years in just two years. What will that mean for our grandchildren? Now, there are a lot of very other interesting statistics we could go into. For example, the average U.S. child consumes 110 commercials per day, 400,000 commercials per year, and will see 200,000 acts of mediated violence prior to the age of 18 from Pediatrics Journal. And I can give sources for all of these. Currently, any given day, one quarter of a trillion emails and 60 million Twitters are sent on any given day. And our overall media consumption as the American society is up by 350% in the last 30 years. So that means that we're not only seeing a lot more, but paying a lot more. We pay 800% more than we paid 20 years ago for our media consumption as a society. This means that Dr. Richard Wurham says that many of us now suffer from a disease called information anxiety, especially the white collar world. Information anxiety means the inability to keep up with understanding which platform to choose, which software to upgrade, how many channels to watch, what the latest is in this and that area, how to read all of my faxes, emails, tweets, in depth, text, and how to have a balanced life in the middle of all that. Information anxiety, he calls it, and many, many execs have said, hey, he spotted it, I've got it. So what do we do in a world of handheld devices, magazines, video games, I everything, social media of all kinds, and perhaps up to two fifths of all our programming is now advertising? Whatever those numbers turn out to be and with whatever margin for error, you can give your own number if you wish. The overall message coming to us from all the media in composite, if you reduce it to one simple message, is something's wrong with you, buy something. There's all kinds of bait and camouflage and tempting programming and so forth to look at, but when you get to the bottom line, those programs do not go on the air without advertising. Advertising needs programming to, to, want, you know, to deliver an audience. And the main theme of advertising is something is wrong with you, buy something. What kind of message is that to give to our children 200, 300 times a day? Now, at this point, you're going to wonder, uh-oh, is this guy a media basher? No. There's a lot of outstanding inspirational and educational and creative and artistic and inventive programming and material. 
In fact, if you are thinking and you can communicate aesthetically, fresh thinking, you'll create better media if given a chance. Media can be therapeutic. In moderation, it can provide happiness and fun, if not education, and life-changing moments. Media can be highly diversified, and one may become the creator, not the consumer with media by composing or producing or directing or writing or designing or performing. However, here's what I began to discover with my students and with the groups I worked with. Not only the demise of original thinking, if ever it existed in the first place, but also in talking to divorce lawyers, we hear a lot more about breaking up and separation and divorce being closely aligned with media, much more than we did 20 years ago. Why? He had a hidden porn addiction. She was on Facebook all the time. He watched sports every night. She said, wait until the commercial. In other words, something came between them that wasn't human. And so this is also between parent and child and grandparent and grandchild, what we hear, how do I reach them? They're in a different universe. They speak a different language. They're fixated on a machine. How do we get through? So this is changing our relationships to not just our thinking. In some of the talks I've used before, the title was Man Marries Media. Who are their children? And by the way, a Japanese man did marry his video game last year, two years ago now. And if a Martian had come to Earth and looked at that, he would be saying, to what extent are machines replacing relationships? Now, the year that he did marry his video game, a lot of people said, well, he's silly or he's crazy or he's a publicity hound. But I saw it as a metaphor because that was the same year that we, as a, a species in this country, showed that we spent more time with machines than with each other. That was the year that the ratio changed. So if we're marrying our media, who will the children be? Intellectually, spiritually, emotionally, socially, politically, economically, culturally, holistically, who will our children be if we're procreating with iPads and eBay and Glenn Beck and 900 phone numbers? And I don't mean 900 different phone numbers, I mean those that begin with 900. Now that's just two factors, relationships and thinking. But what about the environment? We all found the Gulf oil spill to be quite tragic. Quite tragic. But did you realize an additional 25% as much oil was spilled by the media? Every time people wrote an editorial or put out an article or were outraged in ink, ink is petroleum based. So there's another 25%. In fact, more forests are killed by newspapers than by all the loggers Greenpeace would like to lasso. Not to mention the hazardous waste associated with computers, the timber depleted by telephone poles, which is sort of like a forest cemetery if you look at all the telephone poles. We're not using landlines anymore. Phone books, who's read more than the first eight pages concurrently of phone books? are the side effects of fiber optics. Ad nauseum, ad infinitum, ad absurdum. Every technology is creating a tremendous environmental resource depletion, and yet the media are very clever and make us think the environmental problem is something they report and are apart from rather than a part of. So there are several areas that I began to think about concurrently. So the media are part of the environmental devastation. The media are part of our thinking change or paradigm shift. The media change our relationships, often in ways that we're not aware of. And then there was Pascal's problem. You may recall the great French thinker Blaise Pascal said, all human problems reduced to one. Our inability to live quietly in one small room, we seek distraction. Well, what a distraction we have now based on the numbers that I've just read. And distraction from what? What is it we're not facing in ourselves if we always want to have something external as an addiction or habituation? So that's a deeper psychological matter to consider as well. If we put all this together, Pascal, relationships, the environment, thinking, we began to have what I would consider a need for the Walden within. The Walden within. Some place that's free of noise pollution. Now, Walden is a wonderful 
place. I've been there many a time, but most recently there's been a hot dog stand there in the summer. And um, I had two teens the last time I was there texting each other and saying, did you get my message yet? Instead of just telling them what the message was. So I think Thoreau would have a very different experience of Walden these days. And it led me to realize it's not a geographical place that we need to gain perspective in this century. It's a Walden that is media free because consciousness, no matter where you go, you take it with you. And so how do you let the consciousness become clear rather than go to a clear environment? So putting all this together and then having read Richard Louv's book, The Last Child in the Woods, which some of you may have read about children no longer being able to relate to nature, no longer knowing what to do when they're in nature, and many other similar books. With all that in mind, I began to devise something called a media fast. I did it myself, and I did it for three weeks free of media, and then an additional week totally in silence just so I could monitor myself how my consciousness had changed and so forth. And I did it experimentally in other ways, a weekend, a week at different times. That was way back at the end of the 1980s. Different media, but same idea. And over time I said, gee, my students should go through this as well, but I don't want to impose it on them, so I'll give them a chance to be in one of three different groups. So one third of my students, the way that it's worked out, take a practical media fast. They don't cut out all media in their life, but they cut out everything that isn't essential to their survival. So if they were on an airplane and somebody said, you've got to put on you know, your seatbelt and, and watch the video about how to save your life, I'd say that's fine. But other than that, they have a practical media fast. The other third choose to take a media diet. And just like any diet that we might take, you might boost or take down your carbs, boost or take down your protein, eliminate your sugar, your caffeine, whatever it might be. They also use cultural nutrition to find the right ratio of media for them. So they have to think about what they're consuming and say, okay, I'm not gonna cut out all media, but I am gonna cut out my guilty pleasure, whatever that might be, Facebook it might be, texting it might be. Um, a couple were courageous enough to say porn, and we better believe that that intake among teenagers has gone up considerably behind closed doors, and it's so easily available. Some of them say, I've gotta give up, and then you fill in the blank. Sports for some of them, some of my students cannot turn off the Red Sox. That's 168 games a year without stop, virtually. We call them the Dead Sox now. They didn't do too well this year. But the idea being that in a diet, they change their ratio just the way we would in any food diet of consumption. The third group take a monitoring experience. They use a diary. So every time they have a mediated piece of behavior in their world, let's say they get in the car and they go to automatically turn on the radio, they can't automatically turn it. They say, oh, is the media controlling me? Why am I not thinking about this? And that goes in the diary. Or they go home and start to pick up the remote. Oh, is the media controlling me? Is it Hollywood? Is it Madison Avenue? Is it Silicon Alley? I'm not thinking about it. To become conscious of what their media day is like, how many hours they consume, what they do. And then these three groups get together, the diary group, the diet group, and the fast group, and compare notes about how their consciousness is altered and not altered by what they're doing and what their relationship is with the media. We have thousands and thousands, literally, of relationship counseling experiences and experiments and therapies and guidance in the United States alone, all kinds of relationship work, and not one that I found other than the one I'm talking about, about our relationship with media and yet it's greater now than our relationship with other people quantitatively. Why is that? So I want students to do that, to think about their thinking, which parts of it are programmed, whether they're addicted, whether they're habituated, and whether it's better to be in a media-free zone or a low-media zone or a media-saturated zone, which is what the United States is. And what are the pros and cons and what choices can they make? Are we living in a world of choice or are the media thinking us? Are the media habituating us? Are they behavior programming us? Do we go into malls to buy two products and come out with two more that we never heard of? Oh yes, I did hear of that, despite our claim that we're media free. So that's the reason for the media fast, but it even goes deeper for students who want to, who have a spiritual side, or who have a searching side 
to say, so who am I underneath all of this? What is my identity when it's media free? Rather than being told from the outside in who I should be. Now part of what I did to get here, to get to this place, was to live with groups like the Amish, or the Native Hawaiians, or the Diné, or the Rapa Nui, to see what media-free atmospheres were like. So I had a comparative experience, because it's one thing to say theoretically, I left the media behind for a week or a month, big deal. There are people who go on a media fast all of their lives, and so did their parents, 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 parents. What is that experience like, and how is that different? So one chapter of the book is about the media-free cultures. Another chapter is about the low-media cultures, like the Rapa Nui. They have just one newspaper that they get two days later delivered by airplane every day, and one television signal that's sometimes weak, sometimes strong from Chile, their nearest neighbor. And it's been fascinating to see what each of these cultures is thinking by virtue of their low media, no media, or saturated media status. And one of the things our students don't even think about is that all those possibilities are there in the world because we tend to begin to take for granted whatever our culture is doing as the norm. And that's the way we should be. And Waldorf has always stood up and said, no, there's another way we could be. And so have many other people who are living their tribal existence or their alternative existence or they're challenging the status quo existence. And I want students to know about all those, that they're choices we can make about our relationship with media. So an area that also got my interest are what I call the three ups, speed up, blow up, and keep up. I think most of us know about speed up. Is it healthy? What are the pros and cons? Blow up, larger and larger entertainment systems, larger and larger programming venues, more realistic everything, and keep up. All the upgrades, all the changes in platforms, Am I really cool if what I have in my pants isn't flat like this? And how do I know what the ratio of speed up, blow up, and keep up should be, or should I even be concerned? Thoreau probably wouldn't be. What are the pros and cons? Ultimately, all this adds up to, in the experience, can I reclaim my own thinking, my own time, my own creativity, my own money, Money is huge in this. If you stop having media, you're saving a lot of money. My own health, Dr. Gaeta prescribed a media fast to many of his patients. And I ran into someone else today, David Pasikoff, who lives here in Boulder, who says he prescribes a media fast to a lot of his overstimulated patients as well. And that's one of the reasons Michael encouraged me to write the book. So what about health as well? If we have an overstimulated nervous system, how balanced are we? What control can I regain with all forms of media such that I am in control of my life and not externals? May I choose and intelligently create my media diet just as I do with what I eat and what I drink, although even there I get into habits as well. So the real question is how conscious am I? How conscious, how alert am I thinking in each moment? And can I shift from the consumer identity to the creator identity? Think of all the things we wanted to create as children, and our children probably want to create them too. To be an artist, to be a painter, to be a musician, to be a dancer, maybe even to be a great filmmaker artistically, whatever the medium is. But if I'm the consumer, one student actually said he lost 20 pounds in a media fast because he got a life. He was a certified couch potato and until he actually got a life he didn't exercise. And I said, well, I never intended that positive benefit, but if that was one of the ones you got out of it, let's publicize it. Maybe others will do that. So you never know what the real impact will be. Again, I'm not anti-media. I've worked with filmmakers and film critics and musicians and others who return to their work much sharper and lighter and clearer and more original and thoughtful and focused after they do a media fast, just as they would after a camping trip or after a sailing trip, or after a great vacation. The media fast or diet can actually improve their effectiveness within the media, paradoxically, or within the theater, or within whatever their art form might be. And the person can become more balanced, have deeper relationships, get caught up on priorities, be more socially integrated, lighter, rested, more productive, and returning to original purpose possibly opening their spiritual side or their service to humanity side 
And by the way, the service to humanity goes down greatly in a highly saturated media culture. We lose 50% of the people who work in charity work when we have a high media addiction. Or what about our service to animals or service to the environment? All of that opens up when we have the time to do it. So ultimately what's back of all this, it looks like it's about the media, it's about me. Take off the DIA, it's a me experience. So that one doesn't die with my music still in me or have on my tombstone. And I asked my students, would you like this on your tombstone? Watched 100,000 episodes of Lost or helped someone, made a difference, contributed to the history of ideas, awakened, awakened someone else, saved a life, loved my child. What would I want on my tombstone? Now this isn't a time to discuss all of the deepest questions of life, but I have opened a number of doors, I hope, and so basically what the book does is take this chapter by chapter how to do an individual faster diet, another chapter on how to do a fast with your class or with your family, and it, you gotta be careful about the way you do it, so that's why there's a whole chapter on it. Thirdly, the note you can imagine what the response would be in some families, we're all going without media starting tomorrow 100%. <laughs> Three, a chapter about the no media cultures like the Amish and the Kogi. Four, a chapter about the low media cultures like the Rapa Nui and the Dani. Five, a chapter on speed up versus slow down. Are we really retarded if we slow down? Retard means slow. What is that word really saying? Is slow not the rhythms of life? Is slow not the speed at which creation occurs? What is slow about that? Next chapter, how media and thinking are related. Next, how media and the environment are related. We had a little taste of that. Another chapter on how media addiction works and how do we break the addiction. And by the way, I'm using the word very aware of the fact that psychiatrists have a specific set of de definitions for addiction and so do medical people. Only two years ago did we feel safe in saying that media addiction was a genuine addiction. We used it metaphorically before, but now we realize it has, goes through the same four processes and we actually have 80 media addiction centers in the United States for kids who cannot stop whatever it is, video gaming, texting, and that goes way back. We had our first media addiction group called Television Anonymous in the 1970s for people who could not put their remote down. I don't know if you've ever had the experience, I've had it, if I was gonna go to bed at nine o'clock, then 10 o'clock, and the remote's still grazing or looking at 11 o'clock, and then I'm hooked by this. Those people couldn't put the remote down even at three, four, or five o'clock. So they lost their jobs or their families, and just like Gamblers Anonymous or Alcohol Anonymous, Television Anonymous grew up. So we've always had the extreme possibility in our society, but now it's much more pronounced both quantitatively and qualitatively and multi-platform wise because it's for several media, not just one, and several types of programming. We have news addicts, we have porn addicts, we have advertising addicts, believe it or not, who love to collect ads, we have soap addicts. We have, you've probably encountered just about all of this. And so the next chapter is, you know, after how you break the addiction, what are the ultimate questions? Who am I under my programming? Once I return to balance and clear thinking in my life, what is my direction? What is my thinking capacity? What is my purpose? What are my prime relations? How do I rebuild my creative, spiritual, intellectual side? And how do I proceed with maximum effectiveness and contribution, whether to family, to society, to self, to causes, to a higher power, to charities, to those who we've neglected? And a lot of students who take a media fast realize, oh, I was neglecting my parents. I was neglecting my aunt who was dying of cancer. I didn't even call her for a whole month because I had this other thing going on in my hand. Those we've neglected, the earth, or whomever. Now this is often the time I say, so if those chapters interest you, you could purchase the book. But I'd like to go much further than that. Say my ultimate goal is how do we find the Walden within in the 21st century and rediscover who it was we set out to be so we will not die with our music still in us. And for that, it's about Gandhi's challenge, we must be the change we wish to be and see in the world. 
So I'm not bemoaning the death of thinking. I'd best do some myself. What about Sartre's notion of freedom beyond mere political freedom, freedom of action, freedom of thought, freedom of perspective, freedom of choice, freedom of insight? And as we approach our question, I think of Martin Buber's, I must be wholly other such as the very one I am, and engage in a true common fruitfulness and genuine dialogue, which is what I hope we're about to do tonight. Martin Heidegger, who was considered the smartest person of the 20th century by some philosophers, I'm not sure how you could weigh his brain to find that out, said that thinking is that which is slipping away. Thinking is that which is slipping away partly because it's being replaced by electronic thinking of others. So I hope tonight we can engage in regaining some of what is slipping away so that unlike Eugene O'Neill's character, we do more than have a moment in which, quote, the curtain lifts, we catch a glimpse of something, and then the curtain falls again. You ever have one of those lecture experiences? The curtain lifts, we catch a glimpse of something, and then the curtain falls again. So I'm hoping we can move beyond that state and genuinely learn from each other and from the act of thinking rather than learn from tabloid infotainment and ideas that we can buy on eBay. So I'm almost ready to entertain all questions so long as you keep in mind in your queries that if they're aggressive or trick questions, I will ask my chauffeur to reply. <laughs> but I also have a question for you. I did bring two clips that I showed to many of your students this morning to give examples of a no media zone and a highly saturated media zone so that they could see and choose and say what's positive and negative about both of those. The first is about seven minutes, the next is about 10 minutes, so there'd be less time for Q&A and community conversation if we see those. I asked the Denver Waldorf group, they wanted to see them, your students saw them, but I'm aware of the time and that you have many of, of you in early morning how many of you would like to see the DVD clips to get a sense of those two extremes? How many of you would like to proceed into conversation? Just a trick question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My chauffeur's going to answer that. Okay, so by far and away, the vast majority say, let's see the DVD clips, so we won't. No. So what, what we'll do, the very first one is... The very first one is from a Hollywood version of the Amish, which is called Witness. You may have seen the feature film. Kelly McGillis and Harrison Ford are the leads in it. The reason I'm not showing you a real Amish community is because the Amish do not want media to photograph them. And so we can't have a documentary about them the way we have, from their perspective, that's an honest documentary, the way we have about many other groups. So even though this is Hollywood's romantic version, I would say that it's very similar to what I experienced when I experienced a barn raising on a Saturday. This is the whole community turns out and for newlyweds, as a gift to the newlyweds, they build the entire barn in one day as a community. So this is one kind of non-mediated experience via the media. <laughs>
that's example number one. Um, obviously, this is a romanticized version, but I can say from my experience, it's not unlike what a barn building does in a whole day. You don't have the orchestra playing in the background. Um, <laughs> And you don't have central casting determining who the parts are played by, but basically, basically this is the kind of idyllic extreme for some people of everyone working together in one place uh, with very little struggle and so forth and so on. Believe me, every community does have its tensions and does ostracize people and does have all of the gossip and so forth that our communities have as well. But nevertheless, the no media zone provides a much quieter, free of noise pollution and other kinds of positive interaction with nature's cycles uh, kind of society. Now, I wanna show you an example of the media saturated world that we live in, only it's a unique example because it's my friend Jean Kilborn, K-A-L-B-O-U-R-N-E. You may know some of her DVDs. What she does is make DVDs about the media. So she uses the media to deconstruct the media or to help us understand the media. She does it for children, for teenagers, and for adults. And she does it on different topics, how the media makes men think they should look, how it makes women think they should look, how it makes children think they should become gender identified as they grow. And this is just one example. Killing Us Softly is her most famous DVD, but she then 10 years later made Still Killing Us Softly, and 20 years later made Killing Us Softly 3, and this is Killing Us Softly 4, which is just two years old, so fairly current. She's surrounded by the media world and most of her career is interacting with it. So I thought this would be helpful to look at. Her Ed D comes from Harvard University and this is a lecture that she was giving at Harvard. So we'll see a fair bit of that lecture, but she also inserts some media examples that are quite interesting. So killing us softly for. I started collecting ads in the late 1960s. Many aspects of my life led to this. My involvement with the women's movement, which was just taking off then, my interest in media, some experiences I had as a model. I didn't intend to create a career, let alone launch a field of study, but that is what happened. I was just paying attention to ads, ads like these. Feminine odor is everyone's problem. <laughs> made for a woman's extra feelings, which presumably are located in her armpits. <laughs> it sure is a load off Roy since I lost 59 pounds. <laughs> or this version, I'd probably never be married now if I hadn't lost 49 pounds, which one woman said to me was the best advertisement for fat she'd ever seen. <laughs> if your hair isn't beautiful, the rest hardly matters. Honey, your antiperspirant spray just doesn't do it. <laughs> your guy, another reason for my doll. <laughs> my boyfriend said he loved me from my mind. I was never so insulted in my life. She's built like all our products, heavy where she has to take the strain. This was an ad for construction material. And keep her where she belongs. So these were just some of the ads that I noticed and saw out there, and I took, cut them out and put them on my refrigerator, and eventually I had a kind of collage of ads. And I started to see a pattern, a kind of statement about what it meant to be a woman in the culture. And eventually I bought a camera and a copy stand, and I started to make slides of these ads and to give a presentation about it. In 1979, I made my first film, Killing Us Softly, Advertising's Image of Women. In 1987, I remade it as Still Killing Us Softly, and then again in 2000 as Killing Us Softly 3. And now, here we are a decade or so into the new millennium. Sometimes people say to me, you've been talking about this for 40 years, have things gotten any better? And actually, I have to say, really, they've gotten worse. The biggest change is that I'm no longer alone, that there are now countless books and organizations, websites, films, other people who are working on these issues. Now, I focus on advertising because I've always considered it to be a very powerful educational force. It's an over $250 billion a year industry. 
Just in the United States, the average American is exposed to over 3,000 ads every single day and will spend two years of his or her life watching television commercials, just the commercials. The ads, as you know, are everywhere. Our schools, the sides of buildings, sports stadiums, billboards, bus stops, buses themselves, cars, elevators, doctor's offices, airplanes, even on food items like eggs. Almost every aspect of popular culture is really all about marketing. Hey! Who drove the freaking yellow Camaro? Huh? There's a car on the lawn! Advertising is more sophisticated and more influential than ever before, but still, just about everyone feels personally exempt from the influence of advertising. So wherever I go, what I hear more than anything else is, oh, I don't pay attention to ads, I just tune them out. They have no effect on me. Now, I hear this most often from people wearing Budweiser caps, but that's another story. Another reason we believe we're not influenced is that advertising's influence is quick, it's cumulative, and for the most part, it's subconscious. As the editor-in-chief of Advertising Age, again, the major publication of the advertising industry once said, only 8% of an ad's message is received by the conscious mind. The rest is worked and reworked deep within the recesses of the brain. So it's not just that we see these images once or twice or even a hundred times. They stay with us and we process them mostly subconsciously. They create an environment, an environment that we all swim in as fish swim in water. And just as it's difficult to be healthy in a toxic physical environment, if we're breathing poisoned air, for example, or drinking polluted water, so it's difficult to be healthy in what I call a toxic cultural environment, an environment that surrounds us with unhealthy images and that constantly sacrifices our health and our sense of well-being for the sake of profit. Ads sell more than products. They sell values, they sell images, they sell concepts of love and sexuality, of success, and perhaps most important, of normalcy. To a great extent, they tell us who we are and who we should be. Well, what does advertising tell us about women? It tells us, as it always has, that what's most important is how we look. So the first thing the advertisers do is surround us with the image of ideal female beauty. Women learn from a very early age that we must spend enormous amounts of time, energy, and above all, money, striving to achieve this look and feeling ashamed and guilty when we fail. And failure is inevitable because the ideal is based on absolute flawlessness. She never has any lines or wrinkles. She certainly has no scars or blemishes. Indeed, she has no pores. And the most important aspect of this flawlessness is that it cannot be achieved. No one looks like this, including her. And this is the truth. No one looks like this. The supermodel Cindy Crawford once said, I wish I looked like Cindy Crawford. She doesn't. She couldn't. Because this is a look that's been created for years through airbrushing and cosmetics, but these days it's done through the magic of computer retouching. Now, computers have been used to alter images for quite some time. Way back in 1989, Oprah Winfrey's head was put on Anne Margaret's body for a TV guide cover. Neither woman gave permission, by the way. And this happens all the time. So we might be looking at a TV commercial and think we're seeing one woman, but we're really seeing four. One woman's face, another woman's hair, another woman's hands, another woman's legs. Four or five women put together to look like one perfect woman. This was a cover for Lucky Magazine that we did, okay. where it was four images to make one image. They preferred her over this model, and we went ahead and pieced together a new girl as a result. So there's some... We're out of all of those. Even the loveliest celebrities are transformed by computer. Kira Knightley is given a bigger bust. Jessica Alba is made smaller. Kelly Clarkson. Well, this is an interesting. It says, slim down your way, but she, in fact, slimmed down the Photoshop way. You almost never see a photograph of a woman considered beautiful that hasn't been Photoshopped. Every picture has been worked on some 20, 30 rounds of uh, going back and forth between the retouchers the, and, the, and the client and the agency. They are perfected to, to death. The Dove commercial called Evolution dramatically illustrates that the image is constructed. It is not real. So 
the image isn't real, it's artificial, it's constructed, but real women and girls measure ourselves against this image every single day. Paradoxically, I consider this media that helps us better understand the media or a positive use of negative media. Um, and so, because it's used in the classroom frequently to help people deconstruct what often in many a young person's life is taken for granted or is part of a trend or something that their entire subculture or cluster is finding quite attractive. So she talks about all the other trends that are related with this, such as anorexia because of advertising's stress on thinness, um, alcohol and drug abuse because of the glamorized version of alcohol and drug consumption and so forth and so on. She has many, many different DVDs. And I'm not promoting genie above all others. There are many, many other people who are working with deconstructing the media and making it more understandable. But I am showing it as an example of media that can be in some ways creative or healthy or educational. And there are many, many other versions of that. And yet I'm showing it at another level. Here is a media free zone, the so-called Amish, and I'm not romanticizing them. They have their problems like all of us, and there are many, many other communities. In fact, Sunrise Ranch is just up the street, and that's a very different kind of approach to spiritual community that has some media in it. Not a lot, but some. And there are many other spiritual communities. Some of you may have been to Findhorn and so forth and so on. So I'm not putting the Amish out as the only variety of spiritual community. Nor am I putting out Jeannie as the only example of someone who's doing something about media's saturation and influence. But I do find it very interesting that in a community, whether it's spiritual or intentional or whatever we call it, identity comes mostly from the inside out. As in a Native American society where I've also deliberately lived, the rhythms of nature, your relation to family, all of those are primal in helping you know who you are. Here, her whole life and career is generated out of telling us who we're not. Every DVD that she's had to make, and I've made things like this too, are in a society where we're constantly having to define ourselves against the media. No, that's not who we are, rather than coming from the inside out. That is astronomically different as an experience, as a lifestyle choice, and as a way of identifying who I am from the inside out. So, those are some of the deeper ways we can go with this, whether with students or with all of us. And I want to open it up to all of you. We have time to communicate as a community. I'll be as respectful, and I know you will be as well. I'm not here to have one-upmanship or uh, show you how great my credentials are. I'm here to learn and to make sure that we all do that. So I open it up in genuine dialogue, as Martin Buber said, beholding the other such as the very one I am. So any of your approaches to dialogue, whether it's questions or whether it's points you'd like to make or whether it's reflections or engaging us in conversation. What is your first name? Carolyn. Carolyn Tom, thanks. Excellent question. So one of the positive areas I found when we had the last Media Ethics Summit. So the question really is, what can we do about this at a large scale, at a macro level, rather than just at a micro level? I've talked about the micro level, so at a macro level. The last Media Ethics Summit we had, it was my job to go and communicate the findings of all the media ethicists to the White House, to leaders in industry like CBS presidents and ABC and NBC, and to go and communicate it also to leading thinkers in Harvard, Princeton, Yale, and I spent a whole two months going to all these people, as well as the FCC, which is supposed to be channeling and monitoring what we watch and so forth. And I found, because we have a First Amendment society, there's a huge amount of resistance and, and hiding behind the First Amendment by corporations in terms of we could have even more violence, we could have even more, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, until I started talking to them parent to parent. And if they took their judge's hat off or their vice president hat off or anything else and I talked to them parent to parent said, look, I've got children. Do you want your children watching what you're putting on the air? I started talking to different people. So I think the one area where we had the most penetration was actually in appealing to people through their role about the violence, the concern they had with too much violence. We have exploding heads Saturday morning at nine o'clock and all kinds of things. And I think enough parents were reached, whether they were vice presidents or FCC commissioners, to say enough already. 
So I feel that was a small victory. It doesn't mean you won't see a lot more violence and even worse violence when you go out there. But I think that humane interaction often is the point of entry in making change at the macro level. Now, at the micro level, I'm a Gandhi fan. I must model it. I must be the change that I wish to see. So in my own family, and I'm not a perfect parent by a long shot, I can't hold a cigarette between my fingers when I say don't smoke. And I also, excuse me, had to work with, so I can't say wait until the commercial if I wanted my daughter not to be in love with Eminem as the next Pope president and, and king of the universe. The, the rapper Eminem was her hero. Um, so one of the rules at the, at the micro level is what am I actually doing? Because that's what will communicate to my child. And another is what's the relationship with my partner? If we're not in agreement, that child will find the softer of the two approaches to do an end run. And they'll also take advantage of the disagreement and it also causes friction between the adults. And if there are other children, there's side effects as well. And then when they come along, they learn from the older children how to run the gamut and get what they want. So um, I think anybody here not have that experience? So, so um, that's at the micro level. And I think the micro impacts the macro level too. That's what Gandhi meant, I think. I think he meant, as I do, so this impacts society. And, um, so both of those are related, but at the macro level, the greatest approach I think is appealing to the human being under the role because the power they have and so forth begins to evaporate at that point and the heart is melted and they say, oh, you know, my kid is vulnerable too. So, please. Barbara. Barbara, Tom. I have a 14 year old boy and I had no idea what battles I was creating and what changes <coughs> I was uh, starting with an iPod. <laughs> and so I'm curious, just strategies that you have in working <coughs> with particularly teenagers who have more and more influence, more time away from you in uh, helping to mold their behavior. And just curious about how they even received you today. OK. So as far as I know, all the feedback that you all have given me is we had a great class this morning. Mm -hmm. If you know exceptions to that, I want to learn because I want to keep making adjustments, <coughs> no matter which group I. But any, anybody who has told me on the way in, by the way, I'm here because my child had a good experience. Thank you, that's great. So that part went okay, but we can't generalize from one hour. Um, and what do we do in those situations? One of the things I stopped doing was preaching because I found that that encouraged her to preach. Again, we are models. And so if I became preachy in a certain way, she'd preach back at me. So I actually started listening to Eminem and the Spice Girls and uh, whoever it was at the time. And um, it was a stretch. It wasn't all comfortable. My heroes were the Beatles and other cultural icons. Um, and I tried to persuade her that the Spice Girls would not be, you know, the rulers of the universe 20 years from now. And, but she couldn't be convinced. She lets me know now that I was right, but that took a while. So there is a long-term <laughs> hope that, you know, the values will change over time and the other person. But what I had to do in myself was personal change as well and actually listen to a lot of the lyrics. And so we'd talk about with Eminem, what about homophobia? What about racism? What about um, you know, him being someone who's just like you, who goes to the bathroom, who has girlfriends, who loses them, who, you know, is he really everything that he seems to be? But I had no credibility until I could actually quote the lyrics to her. And that was a big shock to her uh, that I would actually understand her culture. And because I teach what I teach, I actually sometimes can even shock my students by using references and so forth. So if I divorce myself from their culture, I must always seem like an alien authoritarian dinosaur. And somehow the connectivity without compromising my own integrity, I'm not going to memorize all the lyrics, I'm not going to listen to Eminem for two years, but just doing enough of that to make contact gave me more credibility and we could have a, a better one-on-one -on -one about it. Um, now, regarding the technology, some parents set limits from a time standpoint, but others work the love model better. I'm going to love you no matter what you do. I'm not going to judge you no matter what you do. But by virtue of that, ultimately that love will come through because it's so strong for so long that we can have a dialogue about this and we can talk. And I treat you as a mature equal in the conversation so that whatever you say won't be quickly negated by my experience but we'll actually have Boo Bear's genuine dialogue around this. And over time, I find that what I say sinks in because of the love is so strong, the content is secondary to that.
But if they feel the judgment, the accusation, the alien generations that we're part of, that immediately sets up the wrong atmosphere for anything creative to happen. So those are a few things that I learned. That doesn't make me God in this area. Um, and I think we all are different. We have customized situations. Some of our children have a higher EQ, energy quotient. Some have a higher IQ, some have both. Some have a CQ, a creative quotient. And others can be developed in all those areas. Some are left-handed, some are right-handed, some are um, temporally bound, others are spatially. You know, all of the things that I had to learn about my child that made her different, made her media consumption somewhat different than some of her friends. Patience was something else. The longer I waited, the more she changed gears with the media. So even though I had to set up some boundaries, my bias was always balanced. I'm not going to send her off to an Amish community on the one hand, and I'm not, let her, not gonna let her go to an Eminem concert every night on the other hand, that there's some space in between. I'm going to be balanced about this and reasonable and patient. And I had to come into agreement with my partner too, because unless that agreement was there, there were two different sources of control and she knew how to play them against each other. So anybody else, thank you so much. Please, Jack. So My I'm new friend from over dinner. Yeah. <laughs> um, media freedom, I said that. Um, so I can't speak the statistics at all, but just, just from personal experience, it seems to me that quite a few, I'm 29, quite a few people of my age don't watch so much TV. Mm -hmm. The consumption shifted to the internet. Mm -hmm. And I just wondered if, uh, if you saw any positives in that, in the sense that people are taking more choice over their media consumption because it's no longer central planning and channel hopping between four channels, it's, you know, you choose and also you create because if we're part of the world well, of, you know, the blogosphere and Twitter and so on, we're, we're also putting media out, not just kind of passively consuming. Well, absolutely. People have made this claim all along that the, the more decentralized the media becomes, the more creative you can become because it costs less and you can be the individual creator and so forth. But what does capitalism do with that? What about that? What about that web universe where everybody's supposed to be an equal creator and so forth? How many people look at our website? It turns out that the most popular websites are once again what Amazon.com or CNN.com. They're not the individual creations by and large. And so ultimately, no matter whenever you start that new democracy again, or whenever you get that decentralized medium going again, there will be uh, an imperialist initiative to invade, including by advertising and by spam and by everything else, to turn that back into a corporate paradigm in one way or another. And we've experienced that in virtually all the revolutions. The environmental revolution becomes corporate. We'll abate her and others make money off of it. The, um, the 60s and 70s became co-opted. Um, the Grateful Dead became corporate. And you know what I mean? Other people made the money off whatever the trend was. So all of that means that we can't put our faith in one technology as being the paradigm that changes everything because it's always been the paradigm that changes everything until it got changed back by monopoly, by corporate influence, by institutions. So yes and no for that reason. Make sense? Please. My name's Eric. Eric, Tom. I'm, I'm noticing a huge shift away from advertising. People watch Netflix instead of, you know, I, I personally don't like anything with, with commercials in it anymore. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of people are realizing that the Google clicks don't actually make them any money. And, and do you see a trend away from advertising? Or? It's another good example of deceit going on. So we think there's no advertising when we watch Netflix, but the number of product placements has gone up from 1 to 27 in every movie we watch. So that's 27 ads that we're seeing, and many of them are repeated again and again. The Coke bottle they're holding up, they hold up in four or five shots. So that may be one of the 27 products. So it's subtly going on. Again, imperialist initiative to invade. No matter what we think, it isn't doing it. TiVo was supposed to rescue us from ads, and then there started being pop-ups on TiVo. And so it's almost impossible to get away from advertising. We may think we're doing it, but as we begin to do what Jeannie uh, does there, put it under the microscope, it's everywhere. The latest is ads worn on the forehead in New York, paying people $200 a day to walk around with, and it's, there's a guy who claims he's creating an ad that can be shown on the moon, 
and if you have the right technology, et cetera, et cetera. So marketers, advertisers are looking for new frontiers. They're constantly trying to find ways to make it more subtle so that we don't think it's advertising or so we take it for granted, but it will continue to expand as best I can tell. So yes and no again. Yes, you're right, it may disappear from view in some ways, but that doesn't mean it disappears from influence. Please. If it's so pervasive and the advertising suit that you swim in is pretty uniform, we all are. I mean, there might be subtle differences based on our content consumption, but why are we so different? If it's so powerful and so uniform, why aren't we all the same? So if you look at grains of sand on a beach, they're very different in close-up, but from the macro shot, they're grains of sand on the beach. So we're very different at one level. From an astronaut standpoint, we all look the same when they come to re-entry at a certain point. Then we look very unique when we come to this level of perception. But then when you go inside the cells, we're all electrons and protons. It depends on what level you're at as to whether there's conformity or individuality. From a marketing standpoint, they want as much conformity as possible. So they may get you in different ways. For example, the same company created Cool. So those of us who are cool, smokers, were very different than, than the other people who smoked whatever else that company made called facts. So they marketed to the factual people, the no-nonsense cowboy type people. That was the advertising model for facts. And those people were different, the no-nonsense personality, than the cool, laid-back personality. But it was the same company marketing to two different psychographics. So even though we're different, they may find us and customize the advertising to our differences, not just to our similarities. Make sense? Goes on all the time. And in the mediated world, it will go on much more. For example, was it True Magazine that sent every subscriber to True Magazine their own magazine with a picture of their house shot from a satellite on the cover? So no one got the same magazine. Each one got a different house. They managed to put a different one on there showing us how we can be individually co-opted in the same way that we're collectively co-opted and also showing us the danger of erosion of privacy. So that's going to continue. You've seen the sci-fi movies where you walk into a mall and there are all these holograms saying, oh, you bought three oranges last time. They're for sale over here. Ah, you're an L.L. Bean person. It's down the hall. And all these voices are going into your head. We're not too far away from being able to do that. I hope it isn't done systematically and as a form of noise pollution, but I think we can see the tendencies when online we suddenly get an ad for something that we bought before and we didn't request to get an ad for that, that increasingly we can be manipulated and selected for and singled out according to our shopping habits. We can be tracked and then marketed to by virtue of that. That's going on quite a bit, for better or worse, please. Lorraine, yeah. the Lorraine Fairmont, who <laughs> welcomed me here. The, uh, so, so in the Waldorf schools, there's the ideal of really protecting our children from media as much as possible, and I'm just wondering what, but, but, but the reality is there's quite a variety in terms of when people actually choose to introduce media and which types of media, and it's a really huge ongoing question. I'm just wondering, in all your research on the brain, et cetera, <coughs> you have learned and what recommendations you might make okay. about introducing media to children. Right. For me, the most important thing is that there be someone with them explaining it and talking about it and discussing it no matter what it is, and that it never be excessive. There are three concerns that the American people say they have when all the surveys about media are put together. The first is truth-telling, concern about bias and sensationalism, and all the other forms of deception. The second is excess. Many parents are concerned about excessive violence, excessive even advertising, but excessive sexuality that their children see. And so my bias is balanced that whatever I do, it not be in excess. So even if I allow them to listen to some rock and roll or to listen to whatever it might be, that I do it incrementally and gradually, and they're with them. It's when they're abandoned and neglected and latchkey kids and so forth that we see the worst tendencies possible. Mm -hmm. So the more I'm there, again, loving, and I know that's ambiguous for some people as to tough love, or, or, but the more that I express that, 
the more trust there is and the more I can talk about them and the more I can trust a larger consumption rate. But there's a limit to that consumption rate and the extreme is never allowed for me. General rule, but apply it specifically as you will. Please. Chris, right? Right. Good. Um, this whole idea of being a, we've just been programmed, uh, trained to be consumers, and I'm not sure quite sure how to get around it. I, I, don't, I look at it myself, I think we consume everything, your relationships, the workshops, uh, the newest thing, you know, I mean, people, ideas, it all is like the next replaceable thing, and like on every level. Not just stuff, and um, it seems tough to undo as a kid who my parents stuck in front of a little tiny TV when I was 1950s. I have some long ingrained habits around this. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to be the prince of judgment in all of this and say that there's something wrong with consuming. Um, it's balance that again is my bias and media can be very therapeutic after a long day if you're conscious of what you're looking at and you know when to turn it off and so forth. It can be very healing or uh, to a certain extent. So I would never want someone to leave this with a huge guilt complex of oh my god I'm a consumer and I'll never be a creator. Um, but if I did it anybody can do it. If I turned it off it's not so hard. You know I didn't have anybody give me a PhD in abstinence. You know, it was in the opposite. It was in media fixation. I got my PhD and how wonderful they are and how to explain them and critique them and all that. So I was totally infatuated with it in a certain way, if only to critique it. So if I can do it, I think most anybody can say, wait a minute, for a week I'm going to change my mind. Um, and I'm not going to be controlled by corporations or by whoever it is. I'd like to think my own thoughts. For me, that's pretty exciting, especially in a Waldorf community. I mean, the whole part of the whole heart of what Steiner and Waldorf and so forth is that, that we're important, that we're not going to be homogenized and treated all the same by some mass corporate educational system, that our own personal creativity is valuable. Anybody resonate with that? Our own personal creativity is valuable. And so why not go back to that? Why not make a choice? Why not make a decision? I tell my students about procrastination. The number one problem with students is, okay, you can take all the procrastination workshops. Okay. You can study all the procrastination models. Okay, you can come up with ways to procrastinate next week, but the only way you're going to stop procrastinating is to do it now. Do the job that I just assigned to you now. So I say the same thing about changing from the consumer to the creator. Okay, you can create a six-month program about how you're going to... Okay, you can, but or ultimately you cannot turn on the TV tonight and instead play the guitar that you abandoned that's in your closet two years ago because you want to. So I, I think it can come down to a moment of changing what's called a single switch inside us, an attitude of negativity, pessimism, I'll always be the way I am, to the one of optimism and possibility that I can be who I always wanted to be. And that is, you know, creative. As a child, I may have wanted to be a ballerina, not me. But whatever that is, it's still possible. So please, first thing. Julie. Julie. So I'm going to restate the question, which is to do with several things. One is relatives, and the other is relatives during holidays. And the third is adversarial reaction to my own approach to media lifestyle. Well, I appreciate that. So part of that comes down to what do we do about judgment in any situation, and what do we do about ostracism in any situation, and what do we do about criticism in any situation, what do we do about seeming to be the alternative to the status quo in any situation. We may all come up with different approaches to that. Uh, why don't you buy 10 copies of Media Fast, Fast Media and give it to the <laughs> <laughs> Um And let it slowly work on them until you see them at Thanksgiving. No, I, there, are, there are other answers to this question. Um, so you could invite them on a Media Fast with you. I don't think that'll work. What I would, what I would recommend is, first of all, a non-adversarial approach because self-righteousness breeds self-righteousness. You don't look like the self-righteous type. But I think often what triggers things in people around us is if they think we're superior. And so that immediately sets up in us and them, and that doesn't take us very far and so forth. So I actually, when I took my media fast, one of the guidelines and the ground rules was I will not be antisocial. So if I go to a party and they happen to play music, I'm not going to say, cut the music off, I'm on a media fast. 
I may dance a couple of dances, I may listen for a little while and I'll graciously, diplomatically find a way to do what I set out to do. So for myself, I'm not such a vegetarian that I can't eat a little something. The story is told that Lincoln ate a mouse to keep from offending his hostess because the mouse stuck on the plate. I won't go that far. <laughs> um, but I will listen to a little media in order to create the relationship. The relationship's actually more important to me than the media. I will sacrifice a little bit of what appears to be my integrity because my real integrity is in what kind of relationship do I have with the person. Now, I know that could seem pretty hostile if you're going to be there for the whole holidays with them for seven days and the TV's blaring in the background all the time. We each have to find our own exodus, how many times we're going to go for a walk and what we're going to do. But I think introducing something else sometimes, talking about something that's really of interest to them may make the media recede in the background, having some great jokes to tell, bring your chauffeur with you. Uh, but things that lighten the mood and so forth and break through and never giving up on your own potential to heal the relationship. So I'm not Dr. Phil, but that's what I would do. <laughs> Please, first name. Kate. Kate, hi. So I hear sometimes about the advantages that children who have been exposed to media have in later life in terms of they can tune things out, they can, they have hand-eye coordination. Mm -hmm. From video games, yeah. Yeah, like what's your response to that? There's a little truth in everything, um, but you can also get good hand-eye coordination from lots of other games, some of them even better. but. What I never want to do is seem like I'm immediately against absolutely every part of this. If there's research to suggest that your hand-eye coordination can develop, then why not do a little bit of it with benign video games rather than those where there are 20 beheadings within two minutes um, and so forth. I I'm willing to accept the evidence if that's the case. But again, I want to avoid extremes. I want to play the game first with a child and see where it takes us into what dark alleys and, and what talents. And if my own eye-hand coordination gets better, I may do it once in a while for the fun of it so that we have something to do together, but it will never become habituation, it will never become addiction, and I will never say the content of it if it's really antisocial is appropriate for a lifestyle. That's me. Please, first name? Amy. Amy. Um, you mentioned your conversations with um, other folks at universities, intellectuals who are looking at this problem. Yes. What would it really take to make it be addressed as the public health issue that it is? And is there any conversation about reaching vulnerable populations? How do you um, overcome or um, set regulations on media to the extent that it protects the young people who may not have the families that are educated or have access to resources for um, greater child supervision or outdoor play activity areas and things like that that are what is causing the obesity epidemic that we have. Thank you. So that's great. So my focus is not so much to fight what's wrong as to reinforce what's right. So when I see people in the health community like Dr. Gaeta and others who are doing something positive, or let me tell you about someone who I really like a whole lot at Harvard Medical is Dr. Michael Rich. They call him the mediatrician. The mediatrician because he studied children and he's worked with children both as a Hollywood producer, he started out, and now as a pediatrician who is expert in the effects of media on children and he set up a center to help us better understand how we can turn that around. So whenever I see a bright light like that, a beacon, I, I just did something with him recently. I want to say, wow, this person is working in the health community. He actually has access to the media because he's at Harvard Medical. People interview him all the time, and he's beginning to say, so obesity and TV are strongly related, and we have studies to show it. I want to get behind people like that to get the word out, and Dr. Gaeta and others who do this sort of thing. And forgive me if you're one of them and I don't know that. So thank you for doing it if you are. Whoever, please, yes. Mark. Mark, yes. Um, I'm interested in digging into this word, media, because we certainly use it in the school, and media policy. And much of your talk tonight, we see that how embedded advertising is so I think it kind of goes back and forth, well, what is the media? And I know most of the 
people in this room are pretty subscribed to an idea of no media or less media, which then brings up, well, where do you draw the line? What is media? What is art? So you, and I think sometimes it's generally thought of in, in school here that it's anything but a screen. Mm -hmm. And that's one way of kind of defining it. Mm -hmm. But when you do start thinking, well, you, you said something very interesting in your talk that struck me. You said any, something is mediated. <coughs> and so is media anything that mediates your thought? So is it, I think any art or thing that you're presenting is material that presents a view or an opinion. And we're bombarded by you know, huge opinions on mass scales. And then we could see a beautiful work of art over here that the sculpture, the sculptor created. And it's, it's very different, but is there something in the actual definition of media that you like to? That's great, great question. What's your first time again? Mark. Thank you, Mark, good. All these are great questions. They're things that I think about, not that I have a fundamentalist take two aspirin and go to bed answer for. So, but in a media fast, I define a medium as anything that more than 200 people are involved with. So if you're doing email one-on-one, -on -one, that's not really media because it's almost the same as a phone call or a conversation in some ways. I'm concerned about homogenizing media, mass media, that makes us all think alike potentially. Even a textbook could be homogenizing if it doesn't have the right content and so forth. So I'm concerned about the part of the media that turns us all into sheep or that changes us all in ways that we're not aware of. I'm not concerned about a local newsletter, if only 20 people read it, or a garage band demo tape, even though it's a three chord song that anybody could play that sounds like all the others. I'm still not concerned about it because it's not controlling society in the way that a homogenizing medium is. But advertising clearly, you know, 20 of us may go into a shopping mall to buy two products and buy two other ones. How did we know to do that if it weren't for something that has an influence on all of us in one way or another? So that's my definition of medium, but I think many other people would draw the line in a different place. McLuhan considered clocks and weapons and anything that changed us, the great guru of media, Marshall McLuhan, as a medium. So when he wrote Understanding Media, he had a chapter on the radio, TV, weapons, <laughs> clocks, you know, but all of these things affect us in, in certain ways. So we can think of media really broadly and really narrowly, but my concern is what has the potential to subconsciously control? We might call it propaganda if it's extreme, but we might call it just thought crime in 1984 if it's more subtle and so forth. So that is the media that I'm concerned about. The medium of inspiration that each of us can be is a wonderful use of the word. Um, and the medium of uh, awakening can be a wonderful use of the word and so forth. The word has many rich possibilities. I tell my student, no, no, the plural of media is not mediums. They're the people who channel the dead. It's media. So if we want to get really clear about that definition, but even people who channel something, I'm not judging that either, as long as they're channeling themselves and not CBS. So my concern really is about whether the medium comes from the inside out or whether it is programming in the worst sense of the word programming. Make sense? Please, in the back, thank you. My name is Heidi, and I was wondering if um, any groups have already, other than your students, have taken this up, like a school community or another community, and what that experience has been like. Yes, so thank you. She's asking if there are other media fasts that are going on and so forth. Other people have bought the book in bulk and tried it and so forth. I like to talk to them first because, you know, you can have an adverse reaction when you get everybody in your community to do the same diet if you don't talk through what the consequences might be and so forth. So it's been done with senior citizens who, by the way, really enjoy something different because somebody told them that they're no longer important or that they can't create or, that, or whatever. So it awakens the inner child often in groups like that. Yes, there's a woman at Harvard who's developing a curriculum to do this in the high schools. And, and she is a good friend of mine, and so we're working on that together as we go along. And yes, it has been done in many other types of setting. But could it be done in many more? Well, I'd like to see that. <laughs> Thank you. 
Last question. What an honor, right? My name's Thyra. Thyra. So in your research, I'm wondering, if you touched a little bit on how media can physically influence the couch potato, who when they had opportunity to do something else, was able to have weight loss. But I'm wondering about eye development and what your perception on screen impact is to that. Yeah, excellent. And of course, part of Steiner's brilliance was understanding how development occurs in ways that Piaget and others didn't necessarily see, despite the fact they're considered development paradigms. So absolutely, there are all kinds of physiological and psychological impacts of the media that have been studied, most of which are not particularly promising. For example, you maybe were told by your parents, don't sit close to that TV set, okay? Or you may have been told your mind will turn to mush. Those. <laughs> Those are extreme statements of things that we actually do know about. You may have been told, don't hold that cell phone up to your ear because you need to have an attachment and so forth. All of the research seemed to be conflicted about that initially, and then it was found out that all the pro-research was actually done by the cell phone companies in disguise. And so, yes, we do have the World Health Organization now says cell phone use can be highly likely to be carcinogenic over a prolonged period of time without a headset because you're holding a generator next to your head. So yes, there are lots of physiological problems with the media. I wouldn't live next to a huge power plant, I wouldn't live, and yet we put power plants of different sizes next to us all the time and take it for granted. We have long-term studies on television that show us there are some serious problems with television. We think that there's a correlation with the growth in dyslexia and the growth in media. We can't prove that, but we have that theory. So there are a whole lot of if you think about it, attention deficit, what did I say the greatest distraction of the century was? So many times people who are multitasking with multimedia are more likely to have some kind of brain split personality or inability to focus. That would be common sense, but not all the research is in about that. So yes, there are a lot of physiological, psychological carpal tunnel syndrome from using non-ergonomic keyboards. You may have heard a lot of these things, but all the more reason we need to think about what we're doing. We wouldn't stare into the sun all day, and yet my students stare into all kinds of cathode rays all day. So yeah, we better think about what that means. So I think that's the last question, and I've really enjoyed the quality of, of interaction. Maybe Lorraine should have the last word. <laughs> Thank you, and I especially appreciate your really focus on the preeminence of the personal relationship, which is so challenged. And j just to take from this, if again, if anyone didn't sign up, if you're interested in ongoing discussions about you know media in our world, and especially the decisions we make as parents about media in, in our world of community, make sure to sign up there. And maybe you'll come back another time, Tom. Thank you. <laughs>